Hey, everybody. What's up? I'm Maria Hinojosa. I'm a journalist. I'm an author. I'm a mom. I'm a writer. And this book just came out. And I'm really proud of it. I wrote a version of this for adults, but then I wrote a version just for you. And so um, welcome to Simon Kids. It's great to be here. It's really great to be here. The subtitle is Finding My Voice and Passing the Mic. See the microphone. And that's because I'm a journalist. And um, and I, I think a lot of kids, I hope you'll see yourselves reflected in here. And maybe some of you will decide to become journalists. Here goes chapter two of my book, Once I Was You. Soon after my dad accepted the job offer from the University of Chicago, he was granted U.S. citizenship as an immigrant of extraordinary ability. I mean, I know that is some elitist BS, but I did tell you that mi papi was a genius, un genio. He made the trip north from Mexico City to Chicago by plane a few months later. The plan was for my dad to start his new job, get settled, and find an apartment in Chicago for all of us to live in. My mom and us kids would stay behind in Mexico until he was ready for us to join him. This is the story of how my mom and me and my siblings came to America. But let's correct one common assumption right now. When I was in Mexico, I was already in America. You got that? Mexico is part of North America. So I was born in North America. Then there is South America and Central America. So really, all of us in the Americas are Americans, okay? Acting as if the only people in the U.S. are Americans is one of my pet peeves. I love that word, pet peeves. On the day we were set to leave for the U.S., my mom, a tiny five-foot-tall woman with black hair, thick arched eyebrows, and full red lips, was dressed to the nines in kitten heels and a velvet skirt. She woke up early to prepare her four young children for their very first plane ride together. We would fly from Mexico City to Dallas, Texas, and then in Dallas, we would transfer to another plane to Chicago, where my dad was going to meet us. The year was 1962. <laughs> yes, there were planes back then, but most people didn't use them. <clears throat> Traveling by plane was reserved for special occasions and for the super rich who could afford it. This was definitely a special occasion because my family was not super rich. <clears throat> I was quietly resting in my mother's arms as we made our way through the airport and onto the plane. But my brother Jorge, who was three years old, screamed during the entire plane ride, which apparently was funny and unforgettable. Un guy! Un guy! Un guy! Un guy! He kept yelling out the plane window. He was trying to say, nos callemos, nos callemos, or we're falling, we're falling. But he didn't know how to say that word yet in Spanish. In between Jorge's shouting, my brother Raul was busy asking my mother a bazillion questions because he was the brainiac of the family and wanted to know everything about what was going on. How high was the plane? Why weren't we falling to the ground? How exactly did la gravedad or gravity work? Bertelena, the oldest at seven years old, was looking out the window and crying. She was perhaps the only one of us who understood exactly what was going on. We were leaving our native country. We had all been born in Mexico, and now we were leaving it behind and moving to a place we had never been to before, a cold city in the middle of the United States called Chicago. When I was, one, when I was younger, I used to joke and say that I had ni voz ni voto. I had neither a voice nor a vote in the decision to leave Mexico and come to the United States. For many years, that was how I understood my arrival in this country. I entered quietly in the security of my mother's arms, wearing a white frilly dress that she had made especially for this trip. My big black eyes were fascinated by everything, and yet not a peep came out of my tiny mouth because I was a perfect baby. Mom's chicle. I was just there for the ride. As I got older, <clears throat> I began to have questions about how I came to the U.S. So I asked my mom to tell me more about how we got here. It turned out there was a part of the story that had been left out. It happens a lot. That's why we want you to always ask these questions. <clears throat> we thought the scariest thing that had happened to us on the trip was my baby brother screaming about the plane falling. In fact, flying in the air was the easy part. 
Things got a little strange, though, when my mother and us kids made our way to the immigration area at the Dallas airport. Nowadays, when people come into the U.S. from another country, they're required to go through an immigration checkpoint where government officers inspect their passports and papers to decide whether they have permission to enter. There are usually two lines, one for U.S. citizens and permanent residents, and for everyone who holds citizenship in another country, there's another line. Mexico and the United States sit next to each other geographically, and we share a border. A lot of the southwestern United States, including Texas, California, and the Northwest, almost all the way up to Canada, used to be a part of Mexico. The two countries have a long history of going back and forth between them, but unfortunately, they haven't always had a friendly relationship. Even though on the ground, people who live in La Frontera get along perfectly well with one another and everybody else, there's still this pinche fight brought on by the U.S., by history, and, well, by racism. Here's your trigger warning, okay, kids? The story always starts out nice, like My Sweet Life in La Colonia Narvarte, Chapter 1. Happy Mexicans couldn't care less about what's happening in Gringolandia because they know the world does not revolve around the United States, but some white supremacists were not going to let things end there. Don't get sucked into the lie of American exceptionalism. And you're like, what is that word? Okay. Exceptionalism is a false belief that this country and only this country is the best at everything. Remember, I told you we were going to break some historical truths and historical myths in this book. Racism is nasty and hurtful, and you're about to see it up close. Here it comes. So, <clears throat> in 1916, Tom Lee Sr., the mayor of El Paso, Texas, came up with an ugly notion that Mexicans were not clean. Based on this belief, he and others began calling people like me, trigger warning, dirty Mexicans. It's an offensive term. The phrase became a racial slur because it used hateful words to insult and damage perceptions of other people. Do you know that saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? Well, it's only half true because words have power and those specific words ended up being used to create laws to keep people like me, Mexicans, as well as other black and brown people who were not born here. It was meant to keep us out of the United States. Because of Mayor Lee's words, the U.S. government set up an immigration facility in El Paso on the U.S.-Mexico border. Mexicans who had been used to crossing the border daily to go to their jobs in Texas were now forced to be inspected for cleanliness before they were allowed, <clears throat> before they were allowed into the United States. Can you imagine? What started as a process of immigration officers looking at Mexican bodies to see if they had wounds, or fever, or any kind of sickness quickly turned into ordering Mexicans to take baths in gasoline and to spraying their clothing with poisonous Cyclone B gas in order to disinfect them. I know it's a little bit weird, but it happened in this country. It, it all happened in this country. This went on for 40 years. Can you imagine having to go through this ordeal every day just so that you can go to work or visit your family? That's what it was like on the border. So this brings me back to my mom's story about our arrival in America. <clears throat> After we got off the plane at the Dallas airport, my mom walked us through the airport and got us into the immigration line <clears throat> and got us into the immigration line for U.S. citizens and residents because we had green cards. My mom knew that she had this privilege, right? Even though my family didn't have money, we had been granted green cards because of my dad's job as a highly skilled research doctor who was working on important life-changing technology at the University of Chicago. Actually, they were more of a faded lime green, squiggly lines running through our faces, not exactly green cards. It was called a resident alien card even though the only thing that made us different from U.S. citizens was the fact that we were not born in this country. And that's what they still called it until 2021, when President Joe Biden officially prohibited the use of the word alien from all, from all government documents. Please remember that.
He no longer used the term alien in government documents to refer to people like me who were not born in the United States. It's a big deal. Once we got to the front of the line at the airport at the immigration checkpoint and it was our turn, my mom walked with all of us to the first open booth. Behind it stood an immigration agent who was tall as a redwood tree, a Texan with blonde hair and a mustache. My mom felt like a tiny shrub compared to him. Despite wearing an immigration agent's uniform, he looked like a guy from a Hollywood movie, movie, so my mom imagined that he might be nice. Mom approached him with a smile on her face and extended her hand with our five green cards, our resident alien cards, that she understood gave us permission to come into the United States. That's why when the agent began to study our faces very closely, my mom began to get a little exasperated. I started fidgeting in her arms, so she held me even more tightly to her chest. My sister, Bertelena, pulled my two brothers closer to her as well. Then the agent's eyes darkened and zeroed in on me like a hungry sipol sopilote, a vulture ready to come and eat me. My mom recoiled. Ma'am, you're welcome to come into this country, into the United States, the officer said with a thick Texas drawl. But this baby girl... She's got a little rash here on her arm, and we're going to have to put her into quarantine here. So you and the rest of your kids, you can go on to Chicago, ma'am. We'll just keep the baby girl here. The only reason I had that rash was because I had to use a scratchy blanket on the plane in place of my normal blanket that had been packed up away for the move. <clears throat> my petite, polite mother started yelling at the man, shaking her finger. Something inside of her summoned up a voice that she had never used before. And she told this man, no matter how intimidating and tall that he was, that he was not going to take her baby away, her chicle. He was not going to keep her. After I learned this part of the story, whenever I shared it with friends or spoke about it in the speeches that I give across the country, I characterized my mom as a feminist American icon who had found her voice. I praised her for understanding her rights before she even had citizenship. The story became about how my mom was a badass who answered back to a man who worked in the government and who was many times bigger than her. To me, questioning authority is the true meaning of democracy in action. I relished telling this story and acting it out and giving props to my Mexican mom for being a, femi a feminista chingona badass. People always applauded my mom and her bravery when I finished telling that story. <clears throat> But then, many years later, something happened that changed the way I saw this story. In 2016, 100 years after Tom Lee began calling Mexicans dirty, voters in the United States of America elected a president who would tell them that Mexicans, immigrants just like me, were dangerous. I'm not going to repeat his words here because like, like most of what he says, they are lies. And I deal in truths. La verdadera verdad is. So his words set off a series of ugly policies. <clears throat> During the 45th president's administration, the distrust and dehumanization of immigrants returned to an all-time high. Beginning in 2017, President Donald Trump, along with Attorney General Jeff Sessions and senior policy advisor Stephen Miller, devised a zero-tolerance policy that allowed the U.S. government to respond to the so-called threat of so-called dangerous immigrants by taking away their children. This was people's punishment for trying to come to the U.S. Now you're going to hear people say things like, well, they can't just come here for a better life, or they have to stand in line, or do it the right way. That's a false narrative, okay? There is no line to stand in. There is no pathway to legal citizenship that's easy And doesn't take two to three decades, right? There is no line, right? And the waiting list for immigrant visas average six years to two decades. The idea of coming here for a better life sounds so nice, nice, but how about this reality? You're starving and you'll do anything to help feed your family. 
or you're a refugee trying to save your life from oppressive governments, gang violence, or drought and famine caused by a climate crisis. And you've always heard that the United States describes itself as a welcoming home to immigrants and refugees. <clears throat> These people who are coming are the kings and queens of their homelands. They are the stars of the movie, the survivors of all time. And many of them are our parents, right? I would probably be too afraid, me, <clears throat> I would probably be too afraid to leave everything behind the way these people do. But they make the choice to risk everything so that they can live. Don't you want those kinds of human beings as your friends and neighbors? Right? Don't you want those immigrants and refugees to be your friends and neighbors? But by separating people from their children, the U.S. government was saying, we don't want you here. We don't even want you to think about coming here. So we're going to take away your kids and put them in cages and you may never see them again. This is your punishment for believing the words on the Statue of Liberty. Psych! <clears throat> Later in 2017, after this policy was in place, a reporter was able to get information from someone who worked inside one of the camps where the children were kept in cages. It was, a, it was a recording of the children crying inside those cages. The entire world listened to it, including my mother. And that's when our arrival story changed for me. My mother called me after she heard the voices of those babies and kids in American-made cages. She was crying when she said these words, Mijita, it could have been you. I was like, what, ma? I was not comprehending. Mijita, it could have been you. Those babies who were taken away from their parents, they tried to do that to you, mijita, my daughter. I sat in shock as I realized the truth. The immigration official had wanted to take me away from my mom, from my family. Take me. Mom said the only reason she screamed at the man in the airport was because she went into a state of panic. Not feminism. It was the only thing I thought to do, she explained. I've never screamed in that tone ever before. And it wasn't that I was using my privilege or that I was an American who understood my rights. It was that I was a mother in a state of panic. He wanted to take my child. My new country was welcoming me by threatening to keep my baby. Now, I started crying. In that moment, I realized that an experience like this, even when you're not aware it has happened to you, can imprint itself on you like a tattoo. Once I heard that story, I understood everything about who I am and why I do what I do. I'm a proud Mexican immigrant woman, journalist, and now citizen of the United States. I have a history in this country. I survived nearly being taken from my mom for no other reason than the fact that I was not born here. But I understand my privilege. That's why I'm passing on these stories to you. So that you will keep this history alive and do the work to ask questions about your own history. What I'm trying to tell you is that I found my voice, but I'm passing the mic to you so that you use your voice in this country. And let's make it the country that we want it to be. One that has always said it welcomes immigrants and refugees. Let's do that together. All right. Thank you for subscribing to Simon Kids uh, here on YouTube. Subscribe to Simon Kids so you can keep on seeing these dope videos. And let me know what you think, okay? I look forward to your reactions. And remember, I'm Maria Hinojosa. Once I was you, finding my voice and passing the mic to you. Thank you.